now live. Okay, great. All right, so let me share the slides. Okay, for today we'll go through read mapping, uh, which is a very important step in genome analysis. This is actually um, can be the second or the third computational step in the pipeline. If we consider the first step as base calling and then the second step as quality control, and then this will come in in action in genome analysis. And this is one of the major bottleneck as a computational step. That's why you will see a large number of work try to accelerate uh, this very specific step, either in whole or in parts. And um, uh, during the next or the following weeks, we will have also, we will keep talking about read mapping or the directions uh, followed to accelerate this step, either as filtering, indexing, or even as sequence alignment. And we have very recent work published in S Plus uh, 2022 uh, this year in Lausanne, um, it called GenStore. This work from our research group. And actually we have um, uh, a live stream about it, I think happening in a few days. Um, so if you're interested, you can watch it on our YouTube channel and on our Motlo channel. Uh, if not, we will invite Nika, uh, who is the first author, to give the talk in this course. So either the next week or the week after, she will be delivering a talk on GenStore, uh, which is one of the uh, very recent work about uh, accelerating read mapping. All right. So in the previous lecture, we went through these uh, three sections or three points. What is genome analysis? What is intelligent genome analysis? And how we analyze genomes. Now we agree that all of us get sub uh, sequences of our DNA from all these sequencing machines. Regardless of the sequencing machine you use, you get all those fragments of your DNA. And now because of that, we have a step called read mapping just because of that limitation of the sequencing machine. If we don't have that limitation, probably we won't have read mapping stuff. And for today, we'll explain what is read mapping, what makes read mapper slow, and we will uh, go through algorithmic and hardware acceleration techniques, probably not during this lecture, but during the next or the following few lectures, five to six lectures only on this topic. All right, what is read mapping? So, um, assume you have the DNA sample in raw format or the chemical format, which is chemical molecules only. We cannot read it uh, using computers because just uh, chemistry, right? So we send it to the uh, sequencing machine and you got few fragments from the sequencing machine. Now the sequencing machine has a step called base calling. That base calling step will convert whatever the raw format is into ACGT or text text format. This text format, any computer can understand, or even hardware accelerators. You can convert to two-bit encoded data or four-bit encoded data and so on. Once you get these pieces, your goal is to know where what is the location of every single piece coming from the sequencing machine. So you got what we call a reference genome, and then you try to map each piece into the reference genome until you finish all these pieces and you try to locate them. And then you can say, okay, here you go. This is your reference genome. Of course, you don't, um, you don't consider it as exact match to the reference genome. You are not aiming to build that, but rather to allow some differences because fundamentally your DNA is different from your brother, from others and so on. That's why we map reads to a known reference genome while tolerating or allowing with some differences. So these differences could be either genetic variation between you and other individuals, or it could be some sequencing errors. And that is what simply is the read mapping. Now, what is the reference genome? You can think about it as a puzzle picture or the reference picture, you have it in the puzzle game. 
So you follow this picture and you try to locate every single piece coming from the sequencing machine, which are the reads. And then you try to solve this puzzle by having all the pieces together and see if they are really matching the reference genome with large percentage or large similarity. Uh, again, we are not aiming to find exact matching. So even the piece look exactly the same as here, it might not be located here, but might be located somewhere else because there are few differences between us and the reference genome we use. Now, where we got the reference genome, the reference genome was built uh, uh, or started, started an initiative or consortium between different countries in 1990. In 1990, uh, we started to work on it all the way up to 13 years to get the first draft. And then the improvement continue with the following years. So every year we got a small modification to major version until today. So even until 2021, we keep updating this reference genome. And the reference genome, as we mentioned last time, it's really expensive. So it took 13 years to get the first draft and it was costing at that time $3 billion. The length of the reference genome around 3 billion character. Although there were some gaps in the reference genome and some unknown locations that were hard to read in that time, especially around the telomere and the chromosomes, these are very challenging locations, actually. And in the last year, we have uh, this paper coming from um, a huge group or number of people try to do the assembly in very efficient way using new sequencing technology. So because only of the sequencing technology, we were able to get this new, uh, let's call it a complete version of the human genome. And the modification or the addition or the contribution of this work was around 200 million new bases that we didn't know in that time. They were now added to the reference genome, plus uh, knowing all the chromosomes and so on. But still, the Y chromosomes, for example, is not sequenced. So we are missing the Y chromosome. That's why I'm calling it near complete. It's not the complete, although we have the X chromosome, for example. Now uh, you can access this version publicly. Uh, <coughs> sorry. You can uh, go to this link, for example, you will see a FASTA file or FASTA format. And if you open it, the first few character looks something like this. Of course, this is an older version, but if you go to the recent version, you may see it different from this. I think that is um, uh, the one produced by this work is 2021 um, around uh, July or November. So this is a bit older version, but it's uh, it's it's something similar to this. You can get the FASTA file uh, that is compressed and about 900 meg. If you decompress it, then you'll get something like three gig of data. Now, how long the DNA normally for viruses is something around few thousands. For bacteria, something around million. For human, is billions, so 3.2 billion character. Of course, more or less depends on the population. And if you go to the fruits and plants, they are well known for very long DNA. For example, red onion is 5x longer than ours. And if you go to this Japanese flower, I think this is uh, one of the largest DNA in the world which about 50X larger than what we have. So you can think about the workloads can be really huge, can be very small, depends on what you're looking for. Now, where to get the sequencing data? You have three options. Either you simulate it. There are a lot of simulators uh, or simulation tools that are software. You can download it, run it, and you get reads or you can get from publicly available databases such as SRA from NCBI or NIH. This is a well-known database for sequencing data. You can access this link, for example, you will get this um, data. You can click on the run here, you'll get the FASTQ file. Uh, remember in the reference genome is FASTA format. Here in the read, it's FASTQ. They are different formats. Uh, and uh, because the nature of the data is different. In the reference genome, each chromosome has a full sequence of data. But here, each piece has a sequence of data. So you will see a lot of pieces in this file. 
or you can even do the sequencing yourself. If you are rich enough, you can pay for the sequencing cost, then you can do the sequencing yourself and get the data. Now, assume we have the data, how to map a read. So a brute force solution would be going through the reference genome one by one, and um, you have the reference genome here and you pick the first read, for example. And you said, is it similar here? Is it similar here? Is it similar, similar, similar? No, no, keep going until you find a good location that has high similarity or the highest similarity among all location the reference genome. However, this brute force, it's very expensive, right? Because you are checking every single location in the reference genome. And that is expensive because we are using dynamic programming for examining the similarity, which take quadratic time over there. And uh, if the length of the reference genome is n and the length of the read is k, uh, or the number of reads, or how many times you iterate over the, the reference genome, then that is already a huge workload. And think about you are doing this for the Japanese flower, which is very long reference genome. For that, we don't do the brute force solution, but we, what we do very smart ways uh, can called heuristic, we don't know, but at least it works fine. For example, we require that to have exact location in the read uh, so uh, with the reference genome. And once we have this exact location between the read and the reference genome or exact matches, then we do the uh, further alignment or uh, checking the similarity between the two pieces. For example, I require the 12 character all the way to 20th character in the read to be exactly similar, exactly the same in any piece in the reference genome. So I keep looking for these eight character or nine character. If they are exactly the same with the read, I got, of course, few locations in the reference genome rather than examining all locations. And that's why I call it kind of heuristic because how do you know that these nine characters are the same? If you're interested in this topic, please check this paper. Uh, we already show most of the algorithms used for read mapping during the past 30 years or so. Or so. And we got very good uh, feedback from the community on this uh, work. Now let's go into details on how to do the actual read mapping, not the brute force solution, but efficient solution. It's really similar to the yellow pages. How many of you are aware about this Yellow Pages book? Okay, a few. Okay, got more hands. All right, great. Yeah, this book was used in the old days when the phone was really important, much important than mobile devices. So you don't know the phone number, you cannot record it somewhere unless you have a phone book and then you record it or write it down over there. And this, the nice thing about this book that the names are sorted alphabetically. And uh, if you wanna search for a name, you go to the very first few pages and search what is the section about the names that all start with A. And it will tell you go to section number five and page 220, for example. You start from that page, you got all the names starting with A, and then you move on to the next character. What is the next character in the, in the name you are looking for? If it is B, you go to the next few pages because the first few pages will be A, A, something like that. And you keep checking the next character, then the next character until you get the exact head that you are looking for. Once you get the exact name, then you fetch the phone number as you can see here. So in summary, it's really three steps. First, you need to get the page number from the book index using a small portion of the name. For example, the first character. What is the uh, page number of section that starts with A? And then the second step, you retrieve that page and you go to that section. And then you try to match the full name, character by character. You move on from the name, first character, second character, third character, till you get the full name. Once you get the full name, you get the phone number. And this is exactly how we perform read mapping. Now, how we do that in practice, this is the FASTA file, this is the reference genome, and this is the FASTQ file, which is the read set. The FASTQ file has four lines. So every piece you got from the sequencing machine, 
really has four lines. The first line is identifier, just unique ID to the read you get. The second line, which is very important, is the read itself, the read content. As you can see, ACGTs, and the N is undefined. It's not chemical molecule, just undefined. The sequencing machine cannot read it, but the ACGT are the chemical molecules making your DNA. Now the third line, uh, sometimes it's only plus sign. Sometimes you repeat the ID, it doesn't matter. It's uh, not that important, <coughs> sorry. The fourth line is the sequencing quality of that base. For example, for example here, this is E, it is an ASCII character. So you convert this ASCII character into a percentage sign for example, 30%, that will give you the confidence that the sequencing machine has when it produced the T. For example, if it is very confident about it, you will see something else. As you can see, all these characters are in ASCII format. So you can convert each of them into percentage or a number, and that will tell you what, this, um, uh, what the quality of this base, whether it's high or low. Of course, the highest, the better because you have higher confidence that this is true. Then when you do the matching to the reference genome, you are very confident that this exists in your DNA and this exists in the reference genome. Okay, now we don't want to look for the entire line as is in the reference genome because it will be hard. Plus we have structure variation or genetic variation. Uh, we have really genomic variation between us and the reference genome. So think about uh, all these are deleted by some disease. Then if you look for the entire line as is, you may not find it. What we do, we take only pieces of the DNA. So we take first from the reference genome because it is very large file, three gig of content of, or text. We take pieces randomly or following a very sophisticated method. There are a lot of algorithms you can use synchmers, stropmers, uh, minimizers, um, the overlapping seeds, non-overlapping seeds, a space seed, and, and so on. There are a lot of theories on this. If you're interested in this, feel free to send me email. I can send you a lot of pointers on this. So you pick these uh, subsequences from the reference genome and you store them somewhere where you easily query these pieces. Let's call it hash table. But there are, again, a lot of uh, methods or data structure to accommodate these pieces. Could be uh, FM index, Bohr's Wheeler transformation, a suffix array, or whatever. There are a lot of data structure for this. You can think about database, for example, uh, where you store these pieces and the location. So for example, this piece starts at the location 250, then you store uh, this piece plus the 250 somewhere. Uh, of course, uh, since these seeds are different in length or variable in length, we may not store the seed as is, but we store it as hash value. That will make consistency. Whatever you pick the length of the piece, then the hash value always fixed length. That would make it easier to store in the hash table, for example. Regardless of these details, we store these pieces along with their starting location and the reference genome somewhere in the database. Now we do exactly the same to the fast queue, but remember only to the second line, because this is the genetic content or the genomic content. Now we pick the first piece we have from the read and we query the database we have. Where do you have this exact seed? Of course, if we store it as hash value, we take the hash value of the seed and we said, do you have this hash value somewhere? If you have it, give me all locations and this second blue piece. Now you do the same for the green, give me all locations where the green piece exists in the reference genome. You get this location, number seven maybe, or six, and you get the location of the second piece. The same thing with the red piece, you give me the location where the red piece exists, it gives you two locations. Now what is next? You need to make sense out of these locations. For example, if these located in the read nearby each other, then I, I would, I expect them to be also nearby uh, in the reference genome because it doesn't make sense if the green happening far away from the blue or coming before the blue with very far away distance. There are 
some genom genomic variations, such as inversion, that may cause such effect. But if it is very far, then it might be useless. It really depends on what you are looking for and what are the application. That's why we have a lot of parameters to tweak these. However, most of them require a distance, certain distance or a space between this seed and any other next seed. For example, between the green and the red seed. What is the maximum distance they can be far away from each other? If we met such requirement, then if you look uh, just a holistic overview over all these seeds, you will see that the blue always followed by green piece and the green piece followed by a red piece. And then we said, okay, where we have such behavior in the reference genome. And if you look closely, you will see it, it exists here. So this is the exact same order we have it in the read sequence. We have the blue followed by green, followed by red. And then we said, okay, this piece might be located in that location in the reference genome. And then we want to check the characters between the seeds itself. That's why we do what we call sequence alignment. So we want to investigate these characters between the blue and the green pieces because we never examined them before. And this is what we do in practice. Again, to sum up, just to show you the step-by-step, -step, we got the reference genome, we convert to something else, what we convert into. So the most popular indexing technique is the hashing or hash table. And this was used first in, in genomics in 1988. Now we assume we build the hash table, which has in two columns, you can think about it, or buckets. In the buckets, we store the hash value. And in the other side, or the second column, we store list of locations. What is the starting location of each seed that exists in the reference genome? For example, 1, the 9, 16, 30, and so on. And we keep doing this for all seeds extracted from the reference genome. Now, uh, we call this piece or subsequence, we got it from the reference genome as a seed or k-mer, where the k is the length of the piece. For example, uh, six mers, seven mers, eight mers, and so on, where eight is the, the length of this piece. Building the hash table can be really expensive, depends on the algorithm. For example, Borswiller transformation here uh, can take about uh, one hour to build. And Minimap 2 can take just very few minutes to build the entire hash table. And Mr. Fast, 20 minutes and so on. It really depends on what you are looking for, how rigorous uh, you are in picking the seeds and what is the length of the seeds and so on. As I said, there are different ways to pick these seeds. Each has its own theory and so on, advantages, disadvantages. Now, when we look in our work, we do the analysis for all existing methods on how to build the, the index. You can see really a wide variety of um, compute time and memory utilization or the peak memory for building the index. And you can see not always the hashing is the best, not always Boris Wheeler transformation the best. Because you can see here, for example, in hashing method, they are always faster than this purple uh, Boris Wheeler transformation tool. However, in memory, it's, uh, the Boris Wheeler transformation is well known for compression. They, to provide you a compressed version of the index. That's why it takes the longest to build. So you can see here, it's 50 minutes to build the index. That's why it's making uh, a lot of work just to compress uh, the index itself. But in hash table, we don't have a uh, compression. We have the row hash table as is stored. That's why the memory utilization can be really huge, depends on how many seeds you store and what's the length of the seed. There are other methods, suffix array, for example, if you are looking for variable length, seed matching, for example, this is a well-known method to be used. Now, assume you build the index. You finish the building the index, you store it somewhere, Whenever you need it, you just load it. You don't really need to rebuild it again. You just store the, the database and then load it again once you need it. Assume you got the fastq file, the read set. Of course, we build the index per species. If you are doing comparison with a human, you build database for human. If you do the comparison for viruses, you need to rebuild the index again for that virus. So every time you pick different species, you need to rebuild the index. Now, assume we got the read set. 
what we do, we want to collect seeds the same as, way as we do with the reference genome. We query the seeds in the hash table. We get the location, each seed match. You retrieve a list of locations, and then you try to make sense out of it. For example, the yellow is located before the blue, before the green, as you can see, five, seven, nine. Then it makes sense. Although here it's opposite, like uh, green followed by blue followed by uh, yellow, but there are some um, genetic variation that cause the read to flip. Or while you do the sequencing, you do it for the forward strand, not the reverse strand. As we agreed last time, the DNA is double helix structure. And in one strand, as you can see the annotation, and if we consider this as the forward strand, we consider this as the reverse strand. And here, if you have ACGT, here you should have the reverse complement directly. Or if within the same strand, if you have the reverse strand about it, around it, then you should have the uh, reverse complement of the DNA strand. And during the sequencing, you don't know if you do it for the forward or the reverse strand. That's why you need to consider both cases when you do read mapping. You may assume you do the sequencing to this strand, but if you didn't find matches or you find the matches on the other side and over here, then you could consider that as well, as, as in this case. For example, the yellow start first and then the blue and then the green. Five, seven, nine, which is the reverse complement of this piece. So what does mean reverse complement? You take the complement of this character and you, you start from here, reverse complement of this character, you here. What does mean complement? If it is A, then you convert it to T. If it is G, you convert it to C. If it is C, you convert it to G and so on. Now, these are some of the challenges uh, you will face once you do that. Let me clear the drawings. These are some of the challenges uh, that we need to worry about while you do read mapping. Once you get the location, um, yeah, we can create the hash table with substring from reads to quickly find possible location. Again, the hash table might be one of the options. Now you have the sequence alignment or the dynamic programming, which is once you specify that the start location should be five here, all the way backward, then you pick the full piece from here, including the yellow, the blue, and the green pieces, and that you consider it as a reference segment. And you pick the read or read number one, where we were looking for the similarity. And you take that sequence and the sequence from the reference genome and you do further investigation. So here we have only two sequences of similar length, not necessarily to be the same because there are some insertions, deletions that might affect the, affect the length, but you pick two sequences of similar length. And now you build the dynamic programming table where you investigate character by character. So this is what we call uh, pairwise alignment because you compare every character with the corresponding character from the other sequence, or you do base level alignment. So in the previous step where we do seeding and uh, chaining or matching, you worry about the full seed, whether it exists or not. But here you worry about every character, whether this character exists or not. You can see if the C exists, it means exact match. So we move diagonally. If one of the characters does not exist, for example, the C here over here, it will cause some insertion or deletion or even substitution. So either that character is substituted into something else, for example, A over here, or it could be just deleted. And that what the algorithm will compute for you. So the algorithm will tell you the series of operation that you need to perform on one of the sequences so that you make the others very similar to the first sequence. So for example, it will tell you something like this, 5M, 3I, 7D, and so on. So this is the output of such algorithm, which we call CGAR string. Let me type it as well, CGAR string. So that CGAR string is the things that you can see here is 5M, 3I, 7D. What does it mean? It means seven deletions, three insertions, and so on. That is the series of operation you need to perform 
so that uh, you make the sequence very similar to the other. Uh, let me see where's the cursor. I can delete the annotation. If you have any question, please feel free to stop me. Don't feel shy from the live streaming. Okay, so what we do in this kind of dynamic programming algorithms, we call this algorithm as dynamic programming. Why? We because we build dynamic programming table over here. You can see this table, we call it dynamic program. One of the things we can do is edit distance. What is edit distance? Minimum number of edits, either insertion, deletions, or substitutions needed to make the read exactly match the reference segment. segment. For example, we want to match these two words, organizations and operation. So how we can uh, do that? We calculate edit distance. So if you use that algorithm with different parameter, you either you get this alternative or the other alternative. So you can see here, for example, tells you to delete the P and D e, and then match the R and R and then delete all these um, sequence of characters so that both of them will be exactly the same. So the yellow means they are exactly the same purple either insertion or deletion depends on what uh, sequence you are looking for. If you are looking for organization, then it means you insert them. If you're looking at this, you, then you delete them or you don't have them and vice versa for the blue color over there. Now you have two alternatives, two alternatives. Which one is better to have this uh, matching or this matching? Now that really depends on the user himself or uh, herself. If the user would like to have larger gap, she would prefer the first one because this gap is really larger than in here. Here we have two gaps, for example, in the purple section. So whether you prefer to open a new gap or to extend the current gap, these are parameters uh, defined by the user. And based on these parameters, the algorithm either will output this or that. Now, if you look into another example, for example, organization and translation. So think about these uh, three alternatives now. Which one is better? This, this, or this? Yeah, think about it and let me know. You can write in the chat box or you can enable your microphone. Any answer? So we have three alternatives. However, if you count the things going on, for example, how many uh, operation needed here? One, two, three, four, five, right? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. So this one has four operations. The rest have five operations. So in this case, you really don't have to confuse yourself. You directly pick the minimum. Uh, we have uh, three answers in the chat. Three, yeah, excellent. All of you answer the third one as, um, as the solution. So we will pick the one with the minimum number of operation because this is by definition. If you go back to edit distance definition, you will see the minimum number of edit operation, right? So if, if we got multiple ones with minimum number of operation, then based on the user parameter, we pick one. But if we have one minimum, then that's it for sure. This is the solution. All right, excellent. Uh, let's move on. There's a lot of windows to move from the screen. Okay, now what are the popular algorithms to be used? So since 1988, people were using Smith Waterman, which is a very expensive algorithm, but was doing the most accurate algorithm ever exist until now. People are also surprisingly using Hamming distance. Hamming distance cannot capture insertions or deletions, but can capture very well the substitutions. And this is an algorithm made for error correction or error detection and communication by Richard Hamming. Uh, who's a very famous scientist. 
but they use it to find substitutions because one of the alteration happening to our DNA is substitutions, right? Some characters can be changed from C to G and it will cause something, either phenotype or a disease. And people are still using Hamming distance, which is very cheap to compute, uh, unlike Smith-Waterman, for example. However, if you look currently on the, in the trend, uh, some of the algorithms used, including KSW2, for example, wavefront algorithm, EDLIB, uh, let me write them. So that include EDLIB, KSW2, wavefront algorithm, and many more. There are a lot of new algorithms developed for GPUs, FPGAs, uh, or even CPUs. So these are the current tools used for sequence alignment. If you're interested, you can check them, you can run them. They, all of them are available freely on uh, GitHub. All right, let's move on. Uh, in this work uh, published for, uh, by Honor Mutlo and Jana Lekan, uh, published in Nature Genetics, they did uh, one of the first uh, few read mapper on that, uh, that um, do, or they call it Mr. Fast in that time. This is one of the first read mapper that use hash table, basically. And it was very sensitive. So the aim of that tool at that time was to maintain high sensitivity. That's why the hash table is very large and takes very long time to build because they consider all kinds of seeds. They don't do as in minimizer, for example, you subsample the, uh, the reference genome or you uh, extract few seeds, but extract here a large number of seeds. And this is what makes the sensitivity very high. And when we say sensitivity, it means if you know the read exists, can you still capture the location of that read in the reference genome, assuming it already exists? Even if it has a genomic variation, can you still find it or not? If you find it, then that is high sensitivity. If you miss it, then you quantify this and you give a percentage uh, reflecting the percentage of reads missing because of your tool. Now, uh, these four mapping tools, uh, from uh, back to 20, 20 or 15 years back, you can see the performance after uh, 2011, most of the tools become very fast. So you can see here the runtime, this is uh, the, the dots or the variation you see for each uh, uh, mapper is different data with the same number of read. Uh, so you can see the variation can be really huge from one data set to another data set. And that uh, require further investigation to see the bias. For example, if you report the performance here in, in the paper, you say, we, we evaluate this tool and give us this run time, this might not be true, might not be conclusive. Because if you run another data, then you might get totally different execution time. And that will hurt the reproducibility of the results. However, recently, most of the tools are consistent over different data set, assuming the same workload uh, is maintained. For the memory utilization, it's really is not the main concern currently. For example, one of the recent tool is the fastest, yes, but not the best in memory, as you can see over here. So that can tell you we can scale with the memory or we have very cheap memory devices these days, but we don't have fast enough processors. That's why it's very important to maintain the speed of the tool but for the memory, let's not worry about it since we already have at least 32 gig in uh, typical or traditional CPUs or traditional computers. And that will tell you the trend also or the need for very fast read mapping process. So if you collect all these tools before 2013 and after 2013, you'll see the trend very clear now. Starting from 2011 or 2013, you will see most of the tools maintain the speed, the very high speed. If you propose something that is slower than existing, probably the community won't care about it. They won't even use it. Why is that? What's happening in 2013 or 2011? Why we are now proposing very fast tools? 
If you look to this, the cost of the sequencing, this is the sequencing machine, how much you pay to get uh, a genome, for example. So back in the very old days, it was very expensive. So there were not too many data available for you to do the analysis. So you really don't care. If it takes a week to get the genome, then I can do the, the analysis within a week for the other, another genome that is ready. So nobody cares how fast you can perform that. However, as the cost drops, we are starting, because we are very curious uh, human being, we're starting to question everything around us, even the viruses, bacteria, the plants. We are looking to have the DNA of the banana tree. Who would ever do that in the previous days? Why I would pay $10,000 to read the DNA of a banana tree, for example. These days, we are doing the sequencing for everything, COVID-19, for the ocean, for the farming, to check the quality of the food, the quality of the new babies, and so on. Uh, with that, we have now more data to handle. Everyone is curious to process their DNA. And for that, we have a huge workload. And then the Moore's law is not scaling well. So we need really very fast tools to do the analysis for us. That's why we cannot tolerate, we cannot compensate uh, this requirement. We cannot have even better memory tool, but slower. We cannot afford that. We're always pushing for very fast tool, even if we follow heuristics sometimes. And as you can see, this is where we start to get the long read sequencing or what we call nanopore sequencing, starting around uh, there. I think we got the first device in 2015. The accuracy was not that high, around 65%, but moving over time, we start to get very high accurate uh, uh, devices, so we start to do the sequencing at very low price. Okay, again, this is how we do the read mapping. Now, that is assuming we know what we are sequencing. We know that this molecule is DNA for a human, then the reference genome should be also for a human, right? But if we are sequencing a virus, we cannot map the read to a virus. We should map, uh, sorry, if we do the sequencing to a virus, we should do the mapping also to a virus, not to a human. So the reference genome here, really based on what we are sequencing. Now think about, we don't know what we are sequencing. Think about we have multiple samples or multiple collection of DNA. So if we have this collection of DNA, uh, swap, for example, you go to Hauptbahnhof, um, Zurich Hauptbahnhof, and you swap some, something, you have, uh, you take a sample from the floor, from the restaurant, from the door handles, from the train seats, what you can expect to find that sample. You cannot expect only to have traces of a human, for example. You will see DNA of viruses, bacteria, and many more, right? So now what reference genome to be used in this case? And this is what we call metagenomics profiling. So we got reads from many of these collections together in one sample. And then we cannot use one reference genome, but we use many reference genomes. And then we do the mapping for every single reference genome over there. We keep mapping all of these until we got a location or multiple location per read. And that's why when we build the reference genome or when we build the genomes of the sample, you may find collection of things. So we may wrongly assign these red pieces to the yellow reference genome. And this is wrong, right? Because uh, all should be yellow because this is one individual genome, this is another individual genome and so on. Now, this is very challenging to solve. There are a lot of tools to solve this, but all of them use read mapping read from different unknown donors at sequencing time are mapped to many known reference genomes. So you have database of reference genome, and then you try to do the mapping to all of these. Now you can think about this as m &Ms. So you have genomics, all similar. So when you do the mapping, you use one reference genome to represent all of these. But in metagenomics, you have a collection of reference genomes. Now this is one of the recent work we have called Metal Line. Uh, so you can uh, check this paper, try to do uh, read mapping based uh, metagenomic profiling for many samples. So assume you have, uh, we use for us 
a very huge database that is in total 3 billion, um, um, 3 billion gig, 3 terabyte of, uh, um, of data. That is our reference genome database. So we consider everything exists or that we are aware of. So that whenever you feed in the sample, we always telling you what are the things exist in your sample. We have also recent work. Uh, we participate in this uh, project where the, we evaluate all existing methods for metagenomic. This is published in Nature Methods recently, uh, last few months. Uh, we also we have Miko uh, with our collaborators. Uh, so in all these tools, we try to do read mapping for virus detection or for bacteria or for metagenomics in general, regardless whatever you are looking for, what is the species we can do the detection assuming that you have a sufficient number of reference genomes for the things that you are looking for. Now, what are the challenges in read mapping? You need to find many mappings of each read because you don't know what is the exact location of every read. So you need to find all possible location and then you do some metrics to weigh some other locations over the others. Either you can use similarity metrics or number or number of seed matches for some locations or some other heuristics. We really need also to tolerate variations or sequencing errors. That's why we cannot use um, Hamming distance, for example, most of the time, or we cannot use exact match between the read and the reference genome most of the time, because there are variation, there are sequencing errors that need to be allowed. We need to map or do this process in very fast way. If you remember from the previous lecture, we were talking about critically sick infants, and that is life critical application. So you really need to do this way faster than needed. You cannot wait two days, for example, to do the analysis. And we need to map the reads to both forward and reverse strands because we don't know the sequencing is happening to the reverse strand or the forward strand. So we need to consider that while we do read mapping. There are also some other challenges for example, sensitivity, accuracy, and so on. If you know that read exists from a new reference genome, you should always maintain that information. And also uh, in metagenomics, there are new challenges that we're not um, uh, that we are not taking care of before. For example, you have many reference genomes. How do you know if you, uh, you have a virus or COVID nineteen virus in your sample? So the virus is normally very short. Uh, reference genome and the read set normally is a huge because you are sampling or sequencing everything you have in the sample. So what if a uh, few reads only coming from that reference genome, which is very short and many other reads coming from uh, other reference genome, what will happen in this case? So uh, it's very challenging actually in metagenomics. That's why we use read mapping. You could use other methods such as uh, only indexing and uh, many more. We can talk about it later. However, if you summarize most of the genomic pipelines to be used for the analysis, you will see that read mapping is the central application or the central algorithm used in most of the genome pipelines. So whatever you are doing, metagenomics, assembly, variant calling, or even assembly polishing, you still need to use read mapping either as main step or one of the steps in the pipeline. That's why if you accelerate mapping, you may affect all the other steps. You accelerate all of them. Of course, based on Amdal law, this is different. Uh, if you achieve 20x speed up to the read mapping alone, if you combine it with the pipeline, you may down that into 1x or 2x, depends on how significant or the contribution of this mapping. And I, I can tell that mapping is still the bottleneck, assuming that the, the base caller is not there. For example, you download the data from public available database. You don't do base calling. You do directly mapping or quality control first. The, currently, the trend, since we have uh, cheaper sequencing and we have more advanced sequencing technologies, such as hi-fi reads, the, currently, the trend is to build a population-specific reference genome. For example, think about Zurich City. We want a reference genome that represents people living in Zurich. We want a reference genome that represents people living in Africa and so on. So with every population, we start to have a reference genome 
or what we call um, uh, pan genomics. In pan genomics, we have multiple reference genomes rather than single reference genome to use worldwide. And with that, this is now more challenging because you compare the reads to thousands or hundreds of reference genomes, right? It's not like you're comparing one to one. Since these reference genomes all fall the same species, like all of them for human, then you expect to have 99.9 similarity between them. That's why it makes more sense to represent all these collection of reference genome as a graph, where whenever they are similar, you have one branch, when they are different, you have two branch in the graph, and then you combine them when they become similar and you move on. This is a very efficient way to represent different sequences. So they are similar here, but they are different here so that you maintain the similarity and the differences between all these reference genomes. And then you map the reads to the graph. And then you start using graph processing in these, in these kind of application. That's what we call pan genomics. Let me clear the drawing. Okay. If you're interested in this, you can read this paper. They find that African has 10% more DNA than the rest of the world, than European, for example. And that showed the importance of not having a single reference genome for the world, but rather we need, need population specific reference genomes. And you'll see a lot of work saying that it's the time to change the reference genome. Okay, when we do the analysis, we can see that read mapping is really the bottleneck. So sequencing can perform this very quickly. Uh, so 48 human genome in about two days, but when we do the analysis, only single human genome can be performed in about 32 CPU hours. And that makes it a bottleneck. Now, what makes it slow? What makes read mapping a bottleneck? Of course, first, the cost is really low. So we are able to generate a huge amount of data every year. And we expect this to continue until 2030 to uh, generate a reference genome or sequencing data for every microbiome living with us here on Earth or even in space. We don't know what's there. So that's why we do even sequencing inside the International Space uh, Station. We are still using very sophisticated machine for sequencing, but we are using general purpose computer for the analysis, which doesn't make any sense. So we are using very fast machine to generate a huge amount of data, but when it comes to the analysis, we are still using uh, limited capability machines. We are following von Neumann model, which separate the memory, the storage from the CPU. So it's memory centric or CPU centric. What is the right choice to pick? We don't know. There are some application would benefit from having the data stored in a memory and they do the computation around the memory, or you have the data stored in the memory and you do the computation in totally separate components so that you move the data from storage to memory to caches all the way to the core. Then you do the processing, then you move back the results to the memory and you store it in the storage. It could be very inefficient for some application, especially if it is memory bound, or it could be very efficient for some application where you have it compute bound. It really depends on what you are looking for, what is the right thing. So that's why we have studies uh, try to benchmark a lot of bioinformatics, genomics uh, applications to see what is the right application to be accelerated near memory or near storage or near cache. The data analysis is still performed far away from the data. So you analyze even far from the sequencing machine itself. You need to move the data from sequencer to somewhere else. And that is very inefficient. So the data movement is always expensive. And it's one of the major contributor to the energy of the full system. So it's about 60% of the full energy just spent on data movement. You are not doing any computation now, just moving the data between the components. If you do the analysis for one of the um, uh, state-of-the-art read mapper, you will see that 60% of the time is spent only in verifying the similarity between the sequencing. That is seed chaining plus KSW2. Why the KSW2 is expensive or the checking the similarity is expensive? As we said, it's quadratic time algorithm called dynamic programming algorithm. And uh, why we need it? 
we cannot avoid using dynam uh, dynamic programming algorithm because it gives us very nice advantages. When we compare two words, you are comparing the first character with the full word, the first two characters with the full word, the first three characters with the full word, and so on. So now you can see a lot of repeated operation happening. If I want to compare the first three characters, S, W, and I, why I need to compare S and W again? I just can go back to the previous operation I did and check what I did with S, W, and then continue with the I. That's why I store the value. Whenever I need it, I go back from one cell to another cell, read the value, reuse it again. That's why it's very useful. However, this uh, creates data dependencies. So I cannot compute one of the cells without computing the previous cell so that I can reuse it. And that limits the parallelism. Either I have to go row-wise or column-wise or anti-diagonal because each cell, I need to go back to the previous cell, read the value, reuse it, and move on. And also the entire ma matrix should be computed because the results is stored only in the very last cell here. That will tell you that I have five differences optimally or as a minimum number between this word and this sequence. And this uh, do the mathematical analysis for the algorithm that cannot be done in strongly subquadratic time. I cannot do better than this. If we do also the analysis, once we do the seeding or the seed heads uh, query with the database, I find 98% of candidate location have high dissimilarity with a given read. So most of the time I'm doing the similarity check using dynamic programming algorithm, I end up with dissimilar sequences. So I flush out all these results and I don't reuse them because they don't have significant information. Now, how to accelerate, how to do a better read mapping? You need to look at the compute stack. We have the, the electronics or the electrons, the device level, the logic gates, all the way to the algorithm itself. Either you need to play with the data, compress it, make it smaller, reduce the workload, and then improve the algorithm. Then you improve the compute stack, make it specialized for genome analysis, for example. That, that will help you, um, for example, check this matrix uh, multiplication problem. If you try to solve it using Python algorithm, it will take one X. If you try to solve it using Java, it will be better. But if you solve it using C and AVX acceleration, you will get about 62,000 X of speed up. That is just because of changing the algorithm and uh, uh, having a better acceleration. Mm. For example, just improving the, the, the algorithm implementation plus some hardware acceleration with the AVX. But the lower you go, the better you get in terms of acceleration or speed up. I got a question from YouTube about the differences between individuals. Yes, of course, that is a very valid problem. That's why we have pangenomics. So in pangenomics, we represent different population using different reference genome, and then we do the comparison. However, there are some disease are not caused by structure variation or long variations. So in these cases, when you do the comparison, you still can get a very good results or very good accuracy. For example, uh, looking for SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphism. So these single variations, you can detect them easily, uh, less challenging than if you are aiming for very large variations. That's why some algorithms are tailored only for SNPs, for SNP detections. Some algorithms are tailored only for hi-fi reads. Some algorithms are tailored for only nanopore reads. You can pick the right case, the right application you are looking for, and then you build only algorithm for that case. That will give you the best uh, performance uh, in, if you are interested in finding these uh, um, corner cases, let's say. Again, following on this, if you are using only software improvement, you are not changing the algorithm, you just change the implementation. If you read the fastq file using C, you will get directly a nine, uh, about um, 4x at least, 4x of speed up. Um, just because if you implement the reading part, just reading the FastQ file itself from Python to C, 
you got directly 4x speed up, just reading the input file. And that tell you the, important, the importance of using C as implementation and also using some hardware accelerators to further speed up the entire application. In summary, we really need intelligent algorithms and intelligent architecture that handle data well. Algorithms alone are not enough because you can get um, barely about 5x, 10x speed up. But if you use hardware accelerator, you will get not only speed up, but also energy efficiency and also less data movement, less latency, and probably less uh, space that will allow you for portability. So if you have the analysis equipment, you can have it very small since you are specialized now in operations and that will help you to do the analysis anywhere in the world. That's it for uh, read mapping. Hopefully I, can, I covered already uh, many aspects of read mapping. Next uh, weeks, we will go through the hardware accelerators we proposed in our group and many other groups as well also through the algorithm. So we will visit many of the algorithms used to do the analysis itself. I will leave some pointers here if you're interested to check these before we meet next time. Uh, so these are many of our recent work. We will explain all of them in detail during this course. Uh, these are papers, videos, and some papers if you're interested in knowing all the details. That's it for today. Thank you so much. Uh, again, as usual, if you have any question on YouTube on, um, on the, during the lecture, feel free to send me email if we couldn't have time to take them during the lecture time. Thank you so much and take care.